In today's episode, I'm bringing you three short cases. The first one is of a teacher who did the unthinkable to her young student. The second one is of a woman who was just tired of her man cheating on her, that she took excessive measures. And the third one is of a doctor who, is he a doctor? Let's find out. Welcome, lambs. Welcome to Love and Murder, Heartbreak to Homicide, the Florida Man edition. If you're new here, hi, my name is Kai, and go ahead and listen to this episode. And if you like it, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss any more cases. Before we begin, I want to remind you that this episode and all my episodes are sponsored by my lambs and Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. If you want to be a sponsor of love and murder and get some cool extras, go ahead and subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Now let's get into this Florida Man Friday. The first case comes out of Deltona, Florida and happened on October 23rd, 2024. This happened in a classroom in Forest Lake Elementary where a paraeducator witnessed a scene that shouldn't have happened in school in the first place. A 59-year-old teacher, Vilma Ortero, had allegedly placed a three-year-old, a three-year-old autistic boy in what appeared to be a headlock during their story time. And do I have a picture for this? Yes, I do. According to reports, the paraeducator was preparing activities when she heard the child screaming and crying. When she turned around, she saw the boy lying on his back between Vilma's legs, which were placed on either side of his neck. His face was red from the crying and screaming. Despite the child struggling, Vilma continued reading to the rest of the class, acting like this didn't bother her at all. Because the paraeducator knew that it could be her word against Vilma's word, she took out her phone and took a picture of the incident, which is, like I said, the picture that I do have, which I'll be posting in the Patreon, because any case extras, I do post in the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. After taking the pictures, she called DCF, which is the Department of Children and Families, and also she called 911, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office. Also, the child's family was contacted, and when police got there, they did speak with the three-year-old boy. However, because he was three and he had autism, he couldn't really tell them what happened or how he was feeling or anything like that. He just said, quote, I got in trouble at school, and quote, she hurt me. That's all he was able to, like, relay to them. Investigators also noticed slight redness on the boy's neck, which, you know, went hand in hand with the picture of what the paraeducator showed them. When deputies went to Vilma's house, which I don't understand how she was allowed to leave, but then again, I guess you can't keep her. She denied the accusation, which the paraeducator was very smart because of course she's going to deny the accusations. But ma'am, um, you want to look at this picture and tell us what this is? Vilma said that she had been a teacher for 36 years. She specialized in working with children with special needs and she would never, ever, oh my God, I can't even imagine myself doing something like this. Are you serious? I know this woman, she's going after my job. Of course, that's just me making that part up. But she did say, you know, she specialized with children with special needs and she worked there for 36 years and she would never do something like that. She said with her training, she was taught to move children to a different room when they needed to calm down. And this is what she knows to do. And she said, I would never, ever, ever physically restrain a child like this woman is saying that I did. So the deputy said, oh, okay, well, we want to thank you for your cooperation. Oh, before we go, uh, I just want to show you something. And I just want your thoughts on this. Can you tell us about this picture? And, you know, they showed a picture of her restraining the boy. And so when she saw it, you know, she probably started stuttering, but she didn't change her story. She said, you know, I would never restrain a child in that way. Um, I know that's inappropriate. So, and they're like, you're literally looking at yourself doing this, right hearing this picture. Even so, she maintained her innocence. And the the police were like, okay, well, you know, you can say what you want, but we're going to put you under arrest, which again, how smart was that other woman? How smart? Because if she didn't do that, it would have been like, like I said in the beginning, 
her word against Vilma's word and you have no proof. And then they would have just, you know, well, we can't do anything. They would have just let her go and she would have done this again. So, like I said, she was arrested. She was charged with felony child abuse without great bodily harm and was taken to jail. She did bond out of jail and she's awaiting her next court date on September 19th, 2024. The Volusia County School District did place her on administrative leave while they conducted their own investigation. I hope this is unpaid leave leading to a complete and utter firing and black listing from any school ever in the entire world. So they're doing their own investigation. And then Vilma's attorney came out to speak to the media saying that the photos had been taken out of context. It it had been taken out of context. You know what? This is what I'm going to do. I want everybody to see this picture to tell me how out of context it is. So it's going to be in our Patreon. So if you do want to support Love and Murder, you know, go ahead and sign up to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Love and Murder. But I'm also going to put it in our Facebook group. Now, I don't always do this, but this time I am. So the Facebook group link is in the show notes below. If you want to join, it's a private group. So go ahead and request to join and I'll let you in. You could see this picture and tell me how this could have been possibly taken out of context. But this is what her lawyer said. The photo had been taken out of context. I cannot believe it. Quote, she's a lifetime servant of the community and the photos offered are out of context. He also questioned, oh my God, the audacity. He also questioned why did the parent educator, if if the child was in such dire need, why didn't she intervene directly instead of stopping to take a picture? You ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of that? And it's like, this is the exact reason because people like you would try and get her off so she could hurt other children. That That's the reason. That woman wasn't stupid. She took a picture, even though I know every bone in her body was screaming, hurry up and save that child. But she had to take the picture to avoid this woman getting away with it and doing it to some other child. Ah, I can't. So as the investigation continues, more details more than likely are going to come out. But for now, Vilma stands accused of child abuse, which obviously is a serious charge that could have effects on her career and her reputation. And I guess even though we see the pictures of what she did, we can't just assume what's going to happen and we have to wait for the legal proceedings. What did you think about that case? Please, if you're in our Patreon already or if you're joining the Patreon, go to the Patreon and see the picture if you are not into Patreon, but you want to see the picture, join our Facebook group. Link is in the show notes below. I'm going to have the picture there as well. And then I'm going to have a question of, because I want to know what y'all think. My question after you see the picture is going to be, do you think the photo was taken out of context? I want to hear from you. Put your answers in the comments below after you see that picture, whether you put it below um, this podcast that you're listening to or in the Facebook group or in the Patreon. And I'm going to read those comments on next Friday's Florida Man Friday because I, I don't, I don't, oh, this attorney's comments really irked me. I'll, I'll, I'll say it lightly like that, really irked me. So let's move on to the next case. This incident happened between 45-year-old Denise Nicole Malcolm and her husband, 52-year-old Rohan Malcolm. Now, at approximately 6.32 p.m., one of the couple's sons, so they were twins, actually, one of the twins called 911 to report that basically his father had been shot, but he was still breathing. The boy explained to the operator that he'd been in his room eating Chinese food and listening to music with his headphones on when he suddenly heard loud bangs coming from somewhere else in the house. So then he took off his headphones and went to investigate what that noise was. And that's when he saw his mother standing in the doorway with a handgun in her hand. And he saw his father on the ground bleeding from his shoulder. Meanwhile, the other twin was in the living room when he also heard the gunshots and he ran to the garage not knowing what was going on. 
but his brother had already called the cops and police arrived and, you know, they took the boys and asked them what was going on. Shortly after the boys came out of the house, that's when they heard another gunshot from inside the house. So now the cops are there, the boys out of the house, and they still heard another gunshot from inside of the house. So when police went into the house, they found Rohan laying on his back in the bedroom and they realized that what happened was the this last shot that everybody heard, that's when Denise had give, given the final fatal shot to Rohan. So as they're looking at the body of Rohan, they see multiple gun, gunshot wounds in him. So remember, the boys heard, I think it was three, if I remember correctly in my research, I think they heard three shots and that's when they called the cops. The police saw that blood was pooling under him and they checked for a pulse and he was gone. So Denise Malcolm was arrested and taken into custody without resistance. According to statements from the boys, Rohan and Denise had been estranged for some time. The boys described their parents as continuously arguing. They were always arguing, especially about their father's involvement with other women. They told the officers that the parents even slept in separate bedrooms. So basically just to show that they weren't really together, but they were married, but you know, it was due to the father's cheating. They also told the officers that on the day of the shooting, their parents had gone shopping for a Labor Day barbecue. When they got back home, that's when the situation escalated when Rohan told Denise that he was planning to go leave the house and go meet friends in Port St. Lucie. Denise, already suspicious that he's going out cheating and not meeting his friends, basically thought that that's what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to go meet my friends. She said, you're going to go meet another B-I-T-C-H. So the boy said for the next 45 minutes, maybe an hour, they were arguing. He said, I can't tell you the time because I just put on my headphones, which explains why both of them were just in their headphones zoning out. You should not argue in front of your children. This is just a PSA from Kai. Do not argue in front of your children. If you have an issue in your marriage, quietly speak to your partner. You are messing up your children's psyche if you're continuously arguing in front of them. That is not something you should be doing. That is something I speak passionately about because that is something I believe in. Do I take my own advice? Yes, I do. I do not argue in front of my child. This is not something that children need to need to see. It adversely affects them. And if you're doing it, then this is your wake up call to stop right now. Then they interviewed Denise and she told police that she had been, quote, at her wits end with Rohan's cheating, with his lies. She just couldn't take it anymore. And so that's when she got the gun from her bedroom closet and she stood in the doorway of his room because remember, they don't sleep together. And she opened fire and hit him multiple times. After she initially hit him, she then said that she considered taking her own life, which I highly doubt that for some reason, this is something people say. And I highly doubt that. Like, I couldn't even tell you how highly I doubt that. I think it's just something people say thinking that they will get a lower sentence or a lighter sentence. I don't know why. But anyway, she said she considered taking her own life. And then as Rohan was on the floor He said something that made her change her mind. So instead of committing suicide, that's when she fired the final shot at him, killing him. Then she said that once she had realized what she did, she put the weapon on on a dresser and walked out of the house so that she can be arrested by the police officers. So basically, she did a confession. And her motive was, Rohan is a cheating bastard. In layman's terms, that's what she said. So she was arrested and charged with premeditated murder. And during her court appearance, a judge denied her bond. So she is still in jail at the Broward County Jail. And her twin sons, well, their twin sons are left without a father and essentially without a mother too. So if you are dealing with some issue like this, number one, like I said, think of your children arguing, fighting, anything in front of them is emotionally and mentally detrimental to their health. So you need to get out of your thought process and think about your children, number one. Number two, 
If you're with someone who's a cheater, you need to think about, is this something that you think you could live with for the rest of your life? Because if not, then you need to think about exiting the relationship. Killing them is not the answer. Leaving is the answer because at least your children still have their parents and no trauma. So it goes back to thinking about your children. So that is Kai's mini advice for today. What did y'all think about that case? Obviously, I understand that, you know, it goes into she snapped. But in situations when you have children, when you have other people rely on you, even outside of that situation, you can't let your anger, your temper, your tiredness of a situation when it comes to like cheating or something like that, get the best of you. Murder, obviously, is not the answer, which is a sentence I never thought I would have to say, but murder is not the answer. And the last case I have for you happened on August 21st, 2024, and involves 70-year-old William Bryan, his wife Beverly, and his doctor, Dr. Thomas Sheknowski. So William and Beverly are actually originally from Alabama, and they were just on vacation in Florida. They actually have a rental property in Florida. And while they were on vacation, Brian started getting pain in his left side. So, you know, he needed to go get it checked out. Is it a heart attack? What's going on? So they called 911. He ended up being admitted to the Ascension Sacred Heart Emerald Coast Hospital in Miramar Beach. When he was there, doctors checked him over and ended up diagnosing him with an abnormal spleen and said that he needed immediate surgery to prevent serious complication. So William, and I know I called him Brian, that's his last name. William actually didn't want to go through with the surgery. He actually wanted to go home to his regular doctor, but they told him that he didn't have time to go home to his regular doctor. He needed immediate, immediate surgery. And this was a consultation between Dr. Sheknowski and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Christopher Bassani. They told him that, you know, we can't keep you here as, you know, any doctor can't, but they strongly advise medically that you need to get this surgery right now or it could lead to serious health risks or even death. So William went ahead and agreed to the procedure. So the procedure is called, uh, I'm going to try this, lapars laparoscopic spleen spleen splenectomy, I think. <laughs> so he went in to get this surgery. Unfortunately, during the surgery, William passed away. When Dr. Shiknowski came out to speak with Beverly and let her know what happened during the surgery, he told Beverly, who's a nurse herself, that the, quote, spleen was so diseased that it was four times bigger than it normally is, and it had, quote, migrated to the other side of William's body. So William's body was sent out for autopsy. And look, if you're standing, sit. If you're sitting, stand, because y'all aren't going to believe this. The pathology report that came back on August 22nd, 2024, said that what had been labeled as William's spleen had actually been his liver, lambs. The report also went on to say that because Sheknowski removed William's liver instead of his spleen, this caused, quote, immediate and catastrophic blood loss, and that's what resulted in William's death. Now, if you look at Sheknowski's medical records describing the surgery, it said that he made an incision and, quote, adhesions on the anterior surface of the spleen were carefully taken down. So basically throughout his whole report, He's referring to his liver as the spleen throughout the whole report. For instance, quote, the entire spleen was exposed, noted to be severely deformed. 
This is when in the report, it says the operation was changed to, quote, an open procedure because the spleen appeared enlarged. Then in the records, it continues on and describes that William had, quote, extensive blood loss. He had a blood transfusion, and then he ended up going into cardiac arrest. Then further on in the document, he continued to label what was the liver as the spleen. And it was only identified as the liver after this autopsy. So just so you know, in our body, the liver is in the upper right-hand side of the abdominal cavity, and it's above the stomach, it's above the intestines, and it's above the right kidney. This is where the liver is. Also in the autopsy report, it showed that William's actual spleen was still in his body, and the thing that was causing the pain uh, on his left side was a small surface cyst. So something that would have been easily removed and he would have gone about his day. So let's get into who is doctor, and I'm saying air quotes around the doctor, Thomas Sheknowski. He is a colon and rectal surgeon in Crestview, Florida. He is associated with two hospitals, which is the Ascension Sacred Heart Emerald Coast Hospital in Destin, Florida, and the Twin Cities Hospital in Niceville, Florida. Now, what you'll also be very shocked to learn was that Shiknowski also previously performed a, quote, wrong site surgery in 2023, where he was accused of removing a portion of a patient's pancreas instead of performing an adrenal gland resection. So he was sued for that. But it was settled quietly, and he continued to remain a surgeon at Ascension Sacred Heart. Also interesting to know is that under Florida law, a six to nine month pre-suit process has to take place before you're able to file a formal medical malpractice lawsuit. And in the meantime, the medical board could take months to revoke his medical license. Currently, a criminal investigation is underway for William's death. However, Sheknowski has not been formally charged as of yet. Quote, Walton County Sheriff's Office, in conjunction with the District 1 Medical Examiner's Office and Office of the State Attorney, is reviewing the facts involving the death of William Bryan to determine if anything criminal took place. At this time, it would be incorrect to say criminal charges have been filed. Beverly has retained a law firm to try and get, quote, justice for her husband. And she said, quote, my husband died while helpless on the operating room table by Dr. Shiknowski. I don't want anyone else to die due to his incompetence at a hospital that should have known or knew he had previously made drastic life altering surgical mistakes. And she went on to say that she is going for both a lawsuit and a criminal investigation. Now, North Walton Doctors Hospital, quote, disassociated itself with Sheknowski and took off all his pictures, any references of him on their website and everything like that. However, according to Beverly's attorney, even though his bio appears to be removed from Sacred Heart, North Walton, and wherever other hospital, apparently he's removed from their website. He still appears to be a chief medical officer at another facility, and they didn't name that facility. A representative from Ascension Sacred Heart Emerald Coast said that, quote, we take allegations like this very seriously, and our leadership team is performing a thorough investigation into this event. Ascension Sacred Heart Emerald Coast has a longstanding history of providing safe quality care since the hospital opened its doors in 2003. Patient safety is and remain our number one priority. Our thoughts remain with the family. We hold the privacy of our patients in the highest regard. We do not comment on specific patient cases or active litigation. So Beverly's law firm says that they do intend to file a lawsuit at the appropriate time and that their primary concern right now is the fact that Shaknowski is probably still practicing medicine. Quote, be very careful. 
is what the law firm warned of Florida residents who might be seeking medical care from this surgeon. So just remember the name, Dr. Thomas Shiknowski, and you can actually see the spelling of his name in the show notes below. So just be very careful. No charges has been filed. This is all alleged because the case is still ongoing. So that's all I'm going to say. And I also thought that it was similar to note that these type of errors are not unusual in the United States. John Hopkins did a study and said that operations take place on the wrong body site about 20 times a week. So new fear unlocked. That's all I know. Now, I know we don't normally do cases like this, but I thought this was something that I needed to bring to y'all's attention because I know we do Florida Man Friday and I know a lot of people in Florida listen. So this was a PSA. If you're in Florida or traveling to Florida, you're in Florida in this area for any reason and you end up seeing this doctor on your roster, act accordingly. I'm not going to tell you how to act because again, this is all alleged, but you know, take what you want from what I said here. So those are the three cases that I had for you today. I want to hear your thoughts on these three cases. Have you ever heard of a story of somebody you know, or even yourself, that you went in to get something done? Medically, could be dental, whatever, and they did the wrong thing. Let me know your stories in the comments below. I have never gotten the wrong thing done, but I have an allergy, like an allergy. And I have it all over my medical records. And I did let doctors know, obviously, that, you know, I can't have XYZ, XYZ, XYZ. And this one hospital gave me XYZ and almost killed me. And I think they realized their mistake because they had kept me in the hospital far longer than I was supposed to. So I think they were watching me. But the thing is, right when I left the hospital is when my throat started coming into my mouth. Like literally... I'm not exaggerating to y'all. I promise y'all my throat was coming into my mouth because I kept saying something feels weird. Something feels weird in my throat. And they kept, they kept looking there. We don't see anything. We don't see anything. So when they discharged me, like right across the street from the hospital was a Chinese restaurant. And I had gone with my friends because they were in the hospital with me to the Chinese restaurant. And as soon as we walked in, I went straight to the bathroom because I'm saying that something feels weird and nobody's listening to me. And I went to the bathroom and I opened my mouth and I could see my throat starting to come into my mouth. And so I called my friend in the bathroom. She came and I said, look, I'm telling y'all. And I said, ah, and she said, oh my God. And she ran and got everybody else and they started ushering me to the car. So we went out into the parking lot. And that's the last thing I remember. I started blacking out from there. And they went right across the street to the hospital. By this time, I I don't, I I have flashes of memory because I kept coming through and going back out. And I remember one of my friends was screaming at them that if I die, she's going to sue them all. (laughs) And then I was out again. But, um, that happened. And then y'all know of the recent one with the dentist with my teeth, Um, so that's the two times this has happened. Then I have a whole, oh God, I might do a bonus episode in the Patreon and let y'all know about the horrors that I've been going through in all these years of my daughter's life to the point that my daughter has trust issues when it comes to doctors. But my mom is a nurse. I'm not saying I distrust everybody in the medical field but I do have trust issues when it comes to it. So there are good doctors out there. There are brilliant nurses out there, but there also are stupid, very stupid people out there. So I want to hear your stories and I will read them on the next Florida Man Friday. If you leave a comment for me, that is all I have for you today. Don't forget to go check out that picture that I told you about. You can either do it in our Facebook group or our Patreon. Both links are in the show notes below. And don't forget also that a free and easy way that you can help out Love and Murder is by simply sharing this episode. Share this episode to whoever works in the medical field in your family, and maybe they'll tell you some horror stories also. That's all I have for you today, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.